Steve Oxenrider is a longtime James Bond fan and collector, and we mean a big collector. He's just auctioning over 30,000 James Bond items. 30,000! And you thought you had a big James Bond collection? Steve has also interviewed hundreds of people about Bond, so buckle up as we talk with Steve about his James Bond fandom, how he started collecting, what he thinks makes a good James Bond collectible, and the auctions that are selling or have sold his collectibles. Hi, this is Dan. And Tom. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Your spy movie team bringing you the best coverage of spy movies in the world for almost five years. Steve, it is a thrill to have the opportunity to talk with you. So welcome to our show, Steve. Well, thank you very much. I'm just as thrilled, honored to be here, uh, Dan and Tom. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about myself, my collection, and possibly reach some of the uh, potential bidders out there in some of my upcoming auctions as well. There you go. Great, great. Now, yeah. before we get to the auction, and I know this the auction's huge, but when I talk to somebody, I want to know a little bit more about their background. I mean, I know you're a retired school teacher, but can you give us a little bit of your non-bond background? Okay. At my, my age, it might be a little bit lengthier than uh, <laughs> you want. But anyway, I grew up in a small town of 3000 in Pennsylvania in the 50s and 60s, a town called Millersburg. Uh, now I live in, for the last, oh, since 83, I've lived in Arlington, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. Uh, growing up, we had one movie theater in town called The Colonnade. We had a drive-in theater nearby, about five, 10 minutes away. At the Colonnade Theater, every week they would have three changes of motion pictures. So wow. I lived at the movie theater. <laughs> Wednesday and Thursday nights were my favorite because that's when they would always show either uh, horror, science fiction, fantasy. And even in elementary school, I had started collecting famous monsters of film land. My oh. mother, of course, like a lot of parents, then scorned, you know, that I would have such graphic, horrible magazines. <laughs> Why was I wasting money? This will just give you nightmares, keep you awake at night, and so on. But then you know, if you listen to some of the prestigious directors nowadays, they all were weaned on, on famous monsters. So yep. when I go to a horror movie, I would always tell my mother, when they, my dad would drop me off, I was going to see some biblical epic like uh, Samson and Delilah <laughs> or Ten Commandments. That's nice. <laughs> and uh, they, my dad, of course, knew better because he was the only <laughs> one who drove and he dropped me off. And sometimes he would even join me at the movies. Oh, uh, nice. I have a lot of happy memories at that theater. So my first indoor bond there. My favorite year was 1959. Uh, three of my all-time favorites, and they're still my favorites today, House in Haunted Hill, Journey to the Center of the Earth, oh. and the 1959 Hammer, The Mummy. Uh, oh, yeah. Watch them. Yes. I watch all three of them almost every year. Uh, yes. Unquestionably. Journey to the Center um, of the Earth, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and then the following year was uh, Village of the Damned. And, mm -hmm. of course, you know, the thing there with Hammer and Village of the Damned and so on were the set British settings and so on. So that's how first introduction, you know, to, to British cinema. I started collecting, like I said, in elementary school, famous monsters. There were a series of bubblegum trading cards with horror films on them. And I also had a mountain of Disney books. By graduation high school in 1968, the war, of course, was going on in Vietnam, and my family never really had a lot of money, but they did have enough to send me off to uh, off to college for four years. Uh, in college, I studied uh, secondary education and Spanish for four years, Bloomsburg University. Uh, senior year, I enrolled in a summer seminar program at the University of Madrid. This trip to Spain changed my, my life, really inspired me to travel. And the last week or two weeks we were there in Spain with uh, my friends, we got a URL pass, went to Paris and on to London. And all the time I started seeing, this was 70, right before Diamonds Are Forever came out, started seeing the tabloids in the uh, feature articles about Diamonds Are Forever. So I was picking these up. 
I returned to the U.S. after the summer seminar in Spain. Then in 75, I relocated. I moved to Virginia, and there were plentiful jobs down here. So I ended up staying in Virginia. I taught middle school and high school, English as a second language, for 32 years, and retired in 2007, an easy date to remember. That's pretty cool. All right, let's switch to James Bond. You're mm -hmm. being a lifelong James Bond fan and collector. You've contributed to many of the James Bond books, publications, documentaries as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what that was like? Okay. Are you familiar with Lee Pfeiffer? Do you know Lee yes. Pfeiffer? Yes, yes, yes. Cinema, yeah. cinema Retro. Lee and I and another friend, Gary Fruta, go way back. We were Bond fans and collectors from the start. I think we got to know each other through a magazine called Cine Fantastique. And also there was a, a tabloid, like a newspaper magazine called Movie Collectors World. Uh -huh. And there were hundreds of ads in there. I think that's how Lee and I got in touch with each other. And of course, this is way before the internet. Mm -hmm. So Lee and I remained friends for quite a while. And then in the mid nineties, because uh, Lee was living in near New York, he had access to MGM United Artists Entertainment when they were ready to launch videos, Bond videos had been out. But at that point, there were no extras or commentaries. So when they decided to do some extras and commentaries, they used Lee as a consultant. And Lee, of course, you know, knew that I had a lot of stills and I had already, you know, contacted quite a few actors and actresses in smaller roles uh, that they could use for commentary or for the uh, making of series that yeah. are on the features. I can't remember specifically what I did. The first two were making of Thunderball and making of uh, Goldfinger. I think I just supplied stills. But then for future releases, I gave information to, uh, I think John Cork worked on, on quite a few of them. Right. Yep. And uh, uh, truly, I was supplying stills, uh, contact information for actors, actresses, and so on, that I thought would Burke Qualk, I know, was, was one of them. And I think he's appeared on some of the commentaries as well as the, uh, the visuals. Right. And of course, with a, over 8,000 stills, not at that point, not 8,000, but quite a few thousand, I was happy to help either with stills or provide information on the uh, on the actors' contacts and so on. And as far as books in print, I think I'm acknowledging maybe 20 or 25 books. Wow. Never done a book myself, but uh, I was always happy to, to help other authors and get credit and a free copy. So <laughs> that's great. Um, Another thing for the collection. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I was happy to see you had uh, Mark uh, Cerulli, another very good friend going way back to the six, yes. late seventies, I think. Uh, he did the, uh, by design, the Joe Caroff story. Right. Mm -hmm. I supplied images and very kindly, uh, Mark uh, acknowledged me in the video. And the one I'm, again, really looking forward to is this, uh, you may have heard about this massive compendium, very expensive, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Duncan's book and Dr. No. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I haven't seen it yet, but I supplied 20 or 30 stills for that. Wow. And uh, that'll be coming out very shortly. So, yeah, uh, very and cool. then, of course, I started small with, submitting articles to Graham Rye for his 007 magazine, uh, MI6 Confidential, and uh, let's see it, From Sweden with Love. Oh, yeah. Um, that's about it. Yeah. Well, we, we Bond fans really appreciate that. You weren't hoarding them, right? You were taking the stuff yeah. and getting it so the community could see it. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank Mark's you. really <laughs> was fun to talk to. And actually, we talked to Joe Karoff. Yes, yes, I saw the video. That as well. was fantastic. He is yeah, such isn't a charming. He remarkable? Gentleman. What is he, 106 or something? I think he's 102. 102. But man, he is sharp as a attack. He's just yep. yeah. terrific to talk to. Yeah, what a great yeah, guy. Fun guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wonderful guy. Yes. Yeah, what was the first James Bond movie you saw that kind of got you hooked? 
again, that was at the uh, local drive-in, uh, was the May 1965 Dr. No from Rush With Love. Oh, combination. Uh, the first one I saw indoors was Thunderball at the Colonnade in my hometown. And I think probably since, because of all the reissues with Thunderball, and Dr. No, I think I've seen Thunderball the most times. I'm certain it's well over 150. Wow. But you know <laughs> what? A, Every a, time I sit down to watch it, it's like sometimes the very first time that uh, yeah. it's just That's cool. right there. Yeah. Instant trigger to the 60s. Nice. Yes. The first James Bond movie you saw, you said you saw it in a drive-in. Then you saw right. it indoors. It combo, though. And then I'm assuming you've seen IMAX. I'm trying to figure out the different ways you've seen Bond movies you over know, the years. You know, I haven't seen, what is it, 4K or whatever. Uh huh. I don't think, not that I, that my eyes at my age would deceive. I, I'm not sure. I've seen IMAX, uh, mm -hmm. seen like the very best you can see to this point with, uh, I guess, No Time to Die. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but as far as collecting, you know, it started, of course, with uh, VHS, and then uh, I had laser di I still have the la or had the laser discs. Oh wow! And uh, the laser discs were phenomenal because mm -hmm. Steve Rubin worked in the first three, I believe. Right. Yeah. Some wonderful commentaries in those. Yeah. And then, uh, good guy. Then, of course, DVD, and then there's a wealth of information with the extras. Yeah. yeah, I st I still have the the Golden Eye laser disc. I think it is. that. Do you know what the laser disc for Golden Eye? That's par excellent. I mean, that's the best because yeah. there's uh, I think they have all the TV spots in there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they're just fantastic, really. Yeah. The yeah. extras. Now it's hard to find a TV a player for it. I I, I still yeah. have one, but if that do thing you know, dies, I, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I I wanted to add. Apart from seeing those three films, Dr. No for Much With Love and Thunderball, of course, I hadn't seen Goldfinger at this point. So November 1965, uh, it's on the Thunderball uh, DVD as an extra. They, NBC television did a, a special called The Incredible World of James Bond. And that's what really got me hooked because it was a look at the fourth, what was then the forthcoming Thunderball, and then they did retro clips of Dr. No from Usher Club and Goldfinger. And after that, then I just went insane. <laughs> with, if anything Bond, you know, I snatched up right away. Oh, that's my good. God. Yeah. That's how you get 30,000 items. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> and age. So. Yeah. <laughs> look, we love talking to the actors and the crew and so on. We've heard that you have you talk to quite a few of them by just kind of calling them out of the blue. Can you talk about how that worked and were they, were, were most of them receptive to you? Or did they well, know I, what you were doing or who you were? <laughs> I think you'll appreciate the first two because you did, uh, you did podcast episodes in both of them. Okay. In 1968, Look Magazine did a feature on La Dilenia. Yes. And in the article, it mentioned she was married to a painter named Russell Detweiler. So back then it was very easy. I called directory information, got Robert Detweiler. Uh, he lived in a place called New City, New York. And unbelievably, I would never have the courage to do this today. I called Thanksgiving Day, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it was around 11, I guess, in the morning. And the uh, phone rang a few times. He said, hello, Detweilers. And I said, may I speak to Lottie Lenya, please? And he said, uh, sure. He said, may I ask who's calling, please? And I said, Steve Oxenreiter, I'm a fan. He said, hold on, Lottie, telephone. <laughs> and I'm like in a puddle of sweat now, right? <laughs> Here comes Rosa Club to the, to the uh, telephone. I can't to this day really remember what we talked about, but I remember she was so sweet and courteous. And uh, I wish her first a uh, happy Thanksgiving. And I, I think I apologize for calling on Thanksgiving Day, to be fair. So <laughs> we talked for just one or two minutes. It wasn't very long. And she said, 
send me your address. And she gave me her address. And she oh said, I'll, I'll send you a photograph, right? A signed photograph. So I sent that, got the photographs back. And uh, I couldn't leave well enough alone. About, <laughs> I'd say maybe it was a year later, I called again, right? Oh, now, this, by this point, I introduced myself, right? And of course, she didn't remember. She's talked to hundreds of people since then. And she started off a little bit gruff. And then when I had mentioned, I, this was the second time I called her, she wanted to know if the information I was asking was for publication or anything. And I, I said, no. She said, are you sure? And I said, I, I promise. I said, I'm just a fan. I just asked, you know, what she had been doing recently. And she said she did a movie called The Appointment with uh, Omar Sharif. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was also starring in Cabaret on stage in New York. And I think it was sometime around this point, she was, I think, the full length on Dick Cavett's show. Do you ever recall seeing the original Dick Cavett show? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, there were wonderful interviews he did. And he had yes. her on for the full time. Wow. At a later date, he had Desmond Llewellyn on as well. So oh, I think she mentioned the Dick Cavett show was coming up or something like that. So uh, anyway, she, you know, I that was fun. So then I would say four months after my first call to Lottie Lenya, Harold Sakata had written into Playboy magazine and he signed, I forget what he was, he was, it was regarding a, an article in the magazine and uh, he signed it, uh, Harold Sakata, Honolulu, Honolulu, Hawaii. So, okay, here we go again <laughs> for the second time. <laughs> Two of my all-time favorites. Now, back in 68, well, it's still a long-distance call, but it was considerably expensive. And I knew if I made the call from my house, my mother and father would have a fit. <laughs> uh, so a friend and I went in town. I took my little reel-to-reel -reel recorder along. We went into the hotel in town and used the pay phone. And I called the operator and I said, I'd like to make a call. And I was armed with a bag full of coins. She said it would be $9.55 to call. And uh, she said, do you have it? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, you're sure? She says, because we may become disconnected if, if you run short. So I, I shorted, I did. So she calls Hal Sakata. hello? He answers the phone and she says, is this, is this Harold Sakata? And she said, a friend is calling from the United States. Anyway, I started, she said it would be $9.55. I started putting the coins in. It took three minutes. Because <laughs> and I was he's just nervous, sitting there. Right? My friend was handing them to me and I was feeding them in about a minute and a half. And I have a recording of it. It's really bad, but it's a recording. Halfway through, Harold Sakata just Bursts into laughter because she's telling him what I'm doing, putting all the <laughs> things in the machine, right? So um, anyway, at the end of the three minutes, we finally start talking, and he's just flabbergasted. He said, "Why, wh why are you calling me?" And I said, "Oh, I said, I said you're real popular." I said with Goldfinger and so on. So. Um, he started talking. He took over then, and oh my God, it was it was about a four or five minute call. He had just done. Uh, you might have seen these on uh, on YouTube, but I saw them when they first came out. He did a series of about five or six Vix uh, cough syrup commercials, where he would start coughing and hacking and then karate chopping the oh, furniture yeah. apart. Oh, yeah, 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 there yeah. was one set in an art museum where he smashed all the fixtures and so on. There was one at an amusement park yeah. and so on. So uh, he said, um, you know, he had been working in that, but he didn't at the moment, he didn't have any film plans, but he was looking at some TV scripts. Anyway, it ended up very nicely. And he said, do you have a pen? And I said, yes. And he said, let me give you my address. And uh, I wrote down the address. And I sent, and he sent me four or five beautiful photo cards. I, I should have pulled it out. I have one over here. Uh, nice big jumbo photo cards 
autographed a still from Goldfinger where he's throwing the hat. And we stayed in touch off and on with a postcard till I went to college. I talked to him one more time before I went to university and he wished me a lot of luck to study real hard and do well and blah, blah, blah. And you know what? It's really a pity because once I started college, that was kind of like in the past mm -hmm. and I didn't really think much about it. And I was on to the next Bond movie. Wow. Would it be also step up the next one I called? I don't know, you know, but uh, it was a great way. I mean, this is just two or three short years after I started collecting. So this kind of really cemented and, and made uh, collecting really meaningful. Yeah, I well, bet. I mean, those were different times. <laughs> yeah, they were different times, but I also admire your guts to do yeah. that because oh, I would you know, never... today, man, <laughs> especially with the coins, that's Columbo a great story, say, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I today, I, I, I get panicky when I call for takeout food or something. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's when's uh, the last time you did one of these type of calls where you talk? actually just a week? Well, not quite as extensive. About a week ago. Uh, I called, his name was Alex Brown. Uh, he was in the Black Stuntman's Association. Mm -hmm. And along with Eddie Smith, who was the founder of the- Live and Let Die guys? Founder, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he filmed, Alex Brown filmed in all three locations. Okay. In uh, the boat chase, of course, in New yeah. Orleans. He was one of the, uh, in fact, he's very visible. One of the police motorcyclists in Jamaica. The Jamaicans- were scared to drive the motorcycle, and they were also not very good stunt drivers. So that's why the Black Stuntman's Association of Hollywood took over. And then he did, uh, he helped with the, uh, I guess, some of the, the, the uh, stunt cars at the uh, FDR Drive in New York, the out of control car, mm -hmm. when Bond, shortly after Bond arrives. He was one of the stunt drivers there in the in the lanes, but uh, wow. that that was the most recent one I had done. You know, as soon as you start talking, you know, there's always there's always that apprehension that they're going to just hang up on you, right? Uh, everyone has always been very very receptive. They that's great. Sweetest nicest people you can meet are are, are the bond in the smaller roles. Now I would never attempt, and it would be impossible you know, to call Javier Bardem or, or people like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Only one I called got a little bit aggravated and I was calling on behalf of a friend who, who didn't get his autographed pictures returned. And he said, would you mind calling and asking him if he sent the pictures? Oh, and, and I'm not going to mention the actor, but he said, this isn't what I do for a living, signing photographs. He says, I'll tell him, tell him I'll sign them and send them back. But anyway, that was that was yeah. the only incident that uh, that was really unnerving. So, so you've mentioned actors and actresses here. How about crew members? Do you talk? You know, and actually, you just talked about the stunt guy. So, oh yeah, yeah, quite a few crew members. Murray Cleveland, uh, who did the boat stunts, a mm -hmm. lot of the coordinated all the boat stunts for for Live and Let Die. Uh, you never really. See see her face uh there are three women used in the main titles for from russia with love but the main dancer is julie mendez unfortunately she passed away a few years ago let's see uh tom sanders who did the uh the filming for the uh pre-title of golden eye when the motorcycle goes off the cliff uh he did some of the filming there uh, the the best one, most interesting was, uh, do you know, have you ever heard of John McLaughlin, Big John? He mm. was the go-to guy for Ian Productions. He worked on Dr. No through License to Kill. Oh. And uh, I interviewed him. I actually went, uh, not specifically for that reason, I was in Florida and he lived in Fort Lauderdale. So I met up with him. And he told me all the different contributions he made. Dr. No, he was pretty much the lifeguard when they're filming in the Re Reynolds Bauxite Pier, mm -hmm. uh, where Professor Dent goes. Mm -hmm. He was there when they did the climax, when everyone's jumping in yeah. and so on. 
in uh, Thunderball, he was a shark wrangler. Also, specifically, I know any, anything involving, oh, I know, he only lived twice. He's actually the guy that shot out of the torpedo. But, of course, it wasn't a real torpedo. It's just <laughs> something underwater shot, I believe, in the Bahamas. Yeah, I, I love talking to the, you know, a lot of the background people because you hear about stuff you don't, at least I don't think about very often. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, I didn't think about it that way. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? They're, they're, they're really interesting because they're there for a limited number of the smaller roles, supporting roles. They're yeah. only there for maybe a short few scenes. A woman that uh, that I've, I've been in touch with, and we we're very close friends. We're actually there too. One is Yvonne Shima, who played Sister Lily in Dr. No. She mm -hmm. lives in Toronto. And uh, it's just incredible, you know, to her, Sean Connery was a nobody then. She knew who Ursula Andress was, but Sean Connery, when she filmed her scenes in the reception area of uh, Dr. No's Dr. No's lair. You know, he was just an ordinary guy. She, you know, at that point he wasn't famous. So, yeah. and then one of the showgirls, uh, Shady Trees Acorns, Pat Gill. I've met uh, her. Another close friend. Yeah. She's yeah. actually, right now, she's on the uh, CNN series on uh, Vegas. It's called Vegas, the story of Sin City. And she's in the first four or five minute opening. And uh, she filmed opposite Connery, of course, by that time, 1971, Connery was big. But she said he was so sweet. Just everyone on the, on the set fell in love with him. Yeah, Although he was, good. she said, sometimes he'd show up late. She said, but he, after the liquor started flowing, everyone forgot about it. So <laughs> she said, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, even yeah, I met, Fleming I met, uh, got to love him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, met, I met her in... Uh, Vegas, uh, Matt Sherman did a tour that I went on. And well, I remember I've been to Jamaica three times. The first trip, we tried to find in Falmouth, the swamp where the uh, dragon tank was. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we did so much. The swamp, believe me, looks glamorous on, on screen compared to in person. Oh. And after a few mosquito bites and tick bites and everything we just <laughs> gave up on it so. but uh john cork had heard about that and he said did you find it and i said no because i think they were planning to you know do something it might have been the early beginnings of the, the uh, beginnings of <clears throat> ian fleming foundation looking for some of the vehicles yeah 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 yeah, yeah those are great guys too all right, let's talk about some of your collections and how you got started. You said when you you first, I think you said when you talked to Lada Lenya, you already had started collecting. And yes, so tell point, us how you got started and what, what were your first few items? Well, it started actually very innocently with collecting Philadelphia chewing gum had done a set, uh, James Bond, and that was the first three films. And they did a special set, of course, for Thunderball. Uh, this was Christmas 1965. You guys are probably too young to, to remember anything. Yeah, or, I remember. I'm not even sure you were born. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we were both alive at that point. Oh, okay. Okay, tots, right? Anyway, um, th this, this was bought at its zenith, Christmas of 1965. The stores were just jammed with toys, games, clothing, records, toiletries records, everything imaginable. And uh, things weren't really cheap. I mean, the road race set was something unspeakable. Uh, yeah. Back then, yeah. it was expensive. So, uh, But the one thing you could not get were uh, movie stills and posters. There were, we called them movie star magazines, uh, modern screen, movie mirror, photo play. There were Oh, I think at least a dozen or more. And in the back, they ran ads for movie stills and they would always show Sean Connery because he was like the number one star in 65. So I wrote to a place called Movie Star News in New York. And uh, I, stills back then were only 25 cents or 50 cents. 
And these were like the original things. Some wow. of them even came, I think, directly from Eon or they came from uh, press agencies and so on. So I started collecting that way. And then um, that, that was my first big passion was collecting stills. And then later on, of course, they would offer me posters, one sheet posters. Well, mm -hmm. one sheet poster for Goldfinger was maybe $10 or something like that. But I was intrigued at how many different for one movie. Back then we had one sheets, three sheets, six sheets, 24 sheets, 22 by 28, 14 by 36, yeah. uh, window cards, lobby cards, press book. So that for one film, you know, there was a ton of stuff. And, you know, I just started with uh, really the first one that I started collecting. Everything was You Only Live Twice. But then I tried to go back and get everything from the earlier films. Fortunately, there were places, there was a place in Texas and a place in Miami that offered posters, you know, almost by the pound. It, the things were incredibly cheap. So I got a big bulging package of posters and wow. there were gems in there, you know, and, you know, a lot of this stuff is selling now for thousands at, uh, right. at Ubex and the auction and so on. The yeah, one thing I, I regret I didn't buy were invest more in toys because I remember vividly, and I asked my friend to this day, I said, pinch me, tell me we didn't really see that. The A.C. Gilbert dolls for Bond and uh, Odd Job were discounted at the end of Christmas. In uh, there used to be a place called E.J. Corvettes. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was a big, uh, yep. I think it was, a, maybe it was a nationwide chain. It was, there were so many in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, there were. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There was like a mountain. There must have been a hundred or two hundred or three hundred boxes. All of them were, I think, a dollar a box, right? Oh my so God. I, I ended up buying three or four, but even for me, you know, it was still that was expensive. And uh, uh eventually I kept two of them and uh I ended up selling somewhere along the way, either selling or trading those off. But that's the one thing I, I do kind of regret. But, uh, you know, in recent years, it's, it's been the, the price and so on. Is, plus, I, I wouldn't have space to store all the toys and games. So, yeah, yeah. So for posters and stills, it sounds like you were really heavy into that. How many of those had you owned at one time in terms of the largest number? Well, I had... Close, I think it was 987 posters. Now, this wow. is, of course, this is, you know, this this is everywhere from Brazil to Bangladesh to oh. to Bolivia to Finland. Um, and uh, stills, I'd say, well, yeah, stills, if you include the, 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 color uh, sets overseas sets and so on from france germany and so i'd say over eight thousand stills single <laughs> stills so that you know that that's why when people say oh my god thirty thousand items so, but if you start adding these things up you know eight stills in a set <laughs> times how many countries times how many movies you can get to thirty thousand easily so uh, <laughs> yeah and sure. in fact arguably <laughs> Some of the websites and fan sites and the press have said, you know, Steve Oxnard, largest Bond uh, collection ever. I I know I don't. There are people out there with, I'm sure, much more. Mm -hmm. Some people stay very anonymous. But, uh, but of course, you know, back then, nothing, you know, things you could buy them. Nothing was really vintage because it was all brand new. Yeah, so yeah. prices were low and so on. And uh, the only way, you know, if if you missed, like I did, Goldfinger, the only way you saw it was if it was reissued. You know, they were not sold into television until the 73. So when you had a still or a press book, it was some tangible, like a souvenir from the movie. And you could yeah. take stills out of the gum cards and relive the movie until it was reissued the next time. Mm -hmm. Or a new one came out. So yeah, did you have an all-time favorite poster that you owned? 
Uh, yes, anything with McCarthy and uh, McGinnis artwork on. Number one, unquestionably, was the uh, Style A crater from You Only Live Twice with Bond in the tuxedo walking upside down. Uh, that came out, and I still had that before I sold my collection. The full page, two page uh, New York Times opening day showing him upside down in the crater. And I think they also did uh, the bath sequence from You Only Live Twice. Yeah, yeah. Another one that I liked a lot was the uh, Dan Guze Outer Space Now Belongs to James Bond. Of mm -hmm. course, that's a favorite with many. Uh, more in the tuxedo underneath the space suit. A real simple one is the For Russia With Love. It's only red, white, and black. Oh, yeah. Four panels, James Bond is back, and he's posed in the tuxedo with uh, the Gypsy Girl, I think the masseuse, Tatiana. Yeah. That, that's just striking. Even taglines grab me. It's not the best one, but everything he touches turns to excitement. As soon as I see that, I get chills. You know, I can yeah. remember going to, to see Goldfinger the first time and seeing that tagline. I thought that yeah. was just that's the coolest thing. That's cool. That is cool. So what physically was the biggest, largest item you had? Uh, I think probably, oh, it had to be the um, the standee for Skyfall. And that was just, you know, to me, that was just a few years ago. And it was in the lobby of the multiplex. And of course, like a lot of fans, I think we tend to go there and then we asked the manager, if you're not going to do anything with that, uh, what are you going to do? After? They said they usually throw them away or somebody has already claimed it and so on. So I saw this mammoth thing and a friend said, what the hell are you going to do? How are you going to store that? Where are you going to put it? So so I went back and the man said, you're welcome to take it, but you have to disassemble it. It took almost three hours to take that thing apart oh my gosh. because it looks like it's all cardboard but they're nuts and bolts and oh. wires and everything holding it together so <laughs> that was the largest one uh largest thing i had uh some of the posters i never had a 24 sheet but i had six sheet which i i, I never lived in a place big enough to unfold it fully <laughs> But those are some of the largest ones I had. Wow. And okay, then cool. so that's largest in size. Was there something that you you ended up having, you know, as you're going through this collection? Wow, I've got five of these or something like that. Uh yeah, a lot of times duplicate magazines. Let me think what else. Sometimes like uh toys would be discounted, like the premiere dolls or some of the other things. Uh I picked those up, you know, if, if they were in discount bin for a dollar or something like that. But um, no, not not not. A, I I, re, I traded. I regret, you know, I had some clothing lines like the Norvik shoes, Ellicott Johnson shoes, uh, 007 sweatshirts, and I guess at the time I thought maybe I would wear them, but then I looked ridiculous and I. I <laughs> I ended up keeping them, but I traded them to fran friends, you know, for stills or something that that I treasure much more. Yeah, I got the 007 cologne set. Uh, oh, that was, with the black <laughs> oh, bottle yeah. with the silver caps and stuff. Yep, yep. That I have cool. that. In fact, to me, that is an instant trigger. I mean, you just <laughs> one sip of sniff of that, and it's instantly back in the '60s. Yeah, I never <laughs> wore it then, but. I remember the smell vividly. Yeah. I wish I still had my bottles. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 yeah those, so, that's, I think, an item coming up for sale at Eubank. So you can have your bottle. There you go, Dan. Oh, there you go. If you Thank bid you. high enough, I think there are several gift sets. And uh, uh, wow. almost, I believe all the bottles are, are sealed that they haven't been opened. So. Oh, wow. There that's you go. Cool. There you yeah. go. Mine were all used. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> My mother probably threw them out. Yeah. <laughs> what was what was probably the you know I talk about largest the most number. How about like the strangest thing? Yeah. It's like wow, somebody put this out and I need it. 
Okay. I think in the question you had asked the strangers or the rarest. Let me go with the strangest first. Okay. I, I told you before about meeting John McLaughlin mm -hmm. yep. Fort Lauderdale in uh, 2009. And I asked him, you know, what he worked on Flipper, the TV series, Sea Hunt. And then right. he worked on several of the Bond movies. Uh, and of course, he was Largo's double or uh, Adolfo Celli's double in Thunderball. Yeah. So at the oh. end of the, it was very informal. We did this all on the beach. We had coffee together, breakfast. And then, uh, in fact, I, I don't remember writing anything down, just talking to him. And when I was ready to leave, I said, would you have anything from, from any of the Bond movies you worked on, like Thunderball? He said, let me take a look. He said, I think I think I have some shark's teeth at home, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> about, I'd say it was a month later, very impatiently, a package comes in the mail and it's a padded package. And I open it up and open it up. And inside there was a little tin can and inside, sure enough, were teeth, uh, sharp teeth, but <laughs> they didn't look real pointed and they didn't look as big as what I thought a shark's tooth would look like, right? Well, by coincidence, that weekend, a close friend of mine was coming to visit. And uh, I said, I have a surprise for you because I had several of these teeth in there. I, I said, I have a surprise for you. Well, it sure was a surprise because when I dumped them out, I had just previously just picked one of them. One of them was a human tooth, right? And uh. my friend said, that's that's not a shark's tooth. That's a human. <laughs> Apparently what happened is, and I called, I called Big John later that week and I told him, I said, are these shark's teeth? And he said, I don't know what I sent you. He said, they, they <laughs> might've been shark's teeth. So obviously he must've at some point, I don't know if he was having dental work done or what, but one of his teeth got in <laughs> into that hand when I explained to him, you know, what happened. And, uh, he, he just he thought it was really funny i that thought is... it was kind of creepy myself <laughs> I, I don't think i kept them so uh, oh, uh and then one thing i i have here i can show you now this is from uh it's i think it's now called the jamaican swamp safari is the crocodile farm in falmouth in oh. jamaica mm -hmm. and um i went there i stayed at goldeneye i had the opportunity to stay at goldeneye for a week and I, I was very privileged to have a friend who knew Chris Blackwell, and we rented the place together with five other people for a week. We went to the Falmouth uh, Crocodile Farm, and uh, now the place has been revamped, I understand, all different. But then you could actually go on a small, narrow, it was just a little bit wider than your foot, a little bridge that went out to an island, to the same island that Roger Moore was on. So I walked out there, we looked around, took pictures, but I, all the time, the, the guide, he said, don't get close to the edge, don't get close to the edge. So when I was there, I pulled this out of the mud that was sticking there, and I figured maybe Roger Moore was standing on that stone. So nice. <laughs> that was a little souvenir I brought along back, but Very that, nice. that, that was easy to get. But uh, one short, bizarre story, and it tells you the lengths people go to for collecting. By the late 60s, I was earning money and collecting, and I was getting everything I could uh, get my hands on. And I was teaching elementary school, English as a second language. And we had a new student from a new family of three children from Taiwan. And the oldest, Mary, she comes into the classroom one day, and she's wearing a nice white sweater with 007 logo on it, right? And I thought, what were the chances? <laughs> really? So her limit English was very limited. So that day she was, the kids were writing or reading or something quiet, some quiet activity. And I very gingerly walked over and I took my pencil out and went down into the collar of her neck <laughs> to, to see 
the name tag, if I could see the name tag, and she kind of turned. I said, that's a really pretty sweater you're wearing, Mary. <laughs> oh and I think, oh, my God. You know, if anybody had walked in or seen this. Yes. <laughs> but it turned out the label, She, I think she wanted, she knew what I was trying. And she turned it inside out, and I, it was all in Chinese. So it, it wasn't a real vintage uh, you know, Revere or Adler, one of those those companies that did bond material. So, but that that was today. I you'd be branded for child molestation. <laughs> yeah. Even then, yeah. you would be. So, well, you got lucky right. there. <laughs> yeah. So, so now, did you share your passion and any of your collection with your students? Yes, I started. I well, not right away when I was teaching students it was more so when i went to college to get my education to be a teacher on a majesty secret service was just about to be released i had an english class and we had to do a speech to convince right well i had just got the radio spots press book a teaser poster for on a majesty secret service so i talked briefly about how they promote a film uh, they had never heard a radio spot before, so we played a radio spot. Uh, then I did a very similar presentation a few years ago uh, down here at a community college, and I brought material in. The best audience I ever had, though, was a group of gifted 12th graders in an English class, uh, high school English class. And it was so popular, they had me come back the following week. They ask all kinds of questions, right? And they knew their Bond stuff. And wow. the funniest thing was, <laughs> after class, the kids, some of the kids are real quiet and reticent to answer anything. After class, one of the kids walked up to me and said, Mr. Yanni, Mr. Vargas, Mr. Vargas, Mr. Yanni. <laughs> oh, my God, I couldn't believe this kid <laughs> knew that retain of all things from Thunderball, you, you know, that introduction <laughs> yep. to Henchman. But uh, that that was a lot of fun. And uh, it was one of those situations, you know, that uh, that just makes collecting, you know, you see the appreciation in, in all, many, many gen different generations, you know, that yeah, yeah. even today, Bond is, is very popular with, with people. Yeah. So you, you mentioned all the stills you had. You mentioned all the posters you had. And that, so it added up to like maybe 10,000 items or so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what were some of the other 20,000 items? I, did you do oh, the soundtracks and stuff like that? Too? I had, of course, the posters and stills, yeah. press material. And that can encompass a lot of things. TV spots, radio spots, press books, uh, uh, press releases, programs, brochures, scripts and studio material like call sheets oh nice video and and all the different formats you know that bond came out vhs laser discs autographs i had close i still have quite a few near near 3000 autographs wow. different autographs not 3000 different pieces but different people yeah uh lobby cards merchandising that's clothing toys games bubblegum cards everything imaginable oh and then music and i think 10 about ten thousand magazines and newspapers wow. and the newspapers the ones that were the hardest to part with because almost all these things are replaceable i mean you can get toys games and so on they're expensive but there's a way to get them. Not a lot of people save newspapers. So if you want to get the uh, the original review from uh, the Chicago, Chicago Tribune for You Only Live Twice, wow. it's not available unless somebody has saved it. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. But anyway, yeah, if you if you try to to get back issue newspapers, they're they're virtually impossible to find. Yeah. Um, uh, they, they, I don't even know if they use this anymore. Microfiche, yeah. do you remember mm -hmm. that? Yep. Um, yeah. I would go to the li library and, and I would watch and look at things, you know, from foreign countries that I couldn't get, different ads and so on. So, but yeah, yeah it pretty much that that encompasses the, the 30, 32,000 items. Okay, yeah. so if you've got something that large, right, a, a set like that, 
you've got to be a pretty organized person. And how did you catalog it? How did you know what you had? Okay. In the beginning, it was just on index cards, simple three by five index cards, mm -hmm. different colors for different, like I mentioned, stills, yep. music, uh, yep. whatever. So <laughs> I would write down the index card meticulously where I bought it, when I bought it, how much I paid for it and so on. But then after a while, it got bigger and bigger. And after a while, we got home computers, which didn't exist when I was growing up. So yeah, yeah. all that stuff went on to, this is going back probably at least two decades, maybe, putting all of it on access file. Mm -hmm. So access file in a second, you know, I could find out the name of something, you know, where it was. Yeah. I had to divide it into the estimated cost if I couldn't remember uh, where I got it, where I had it stored in the house. It was easy in the beginning because it was in a few boxes. Mm -hmm. But then when it took over and I had to have a second floor built onto the garage. And so <laughs> and then it got so massive, you know, I would have to, I, I couldn't remember. And, but one of these things I was going to say with a collector, you'll think of something. And, you know, I haven't seen that in a long time. And boy, I'll tell you what, if you don't know where it is, it can drive you insane. Yeah. And I think every collector will tell you this. A lot have admitted it, at least, that they have spent hours not even getting any sleep looking for something they knew they had, but they yeah. didn't know where it was. Mm -hmm. Or you had something, but you wanted to be sure that you didn't miss it. And I, right nearby, I went to a collectible show uh, 30 years ago, maybe. And there was a small French poster, similar to the one behind me, for Goldfinger. And I bought it, and it wasn't cheap. And I got home, honest to God, about two days later, I found I already had it. Mm. <laughs> I did not look at my file before I yeah. went. It's one of these, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to buy now. It's hard to keep track of 30,000 items. Yeah. <laughs> It was a challenge. So That's... you've got an auction going on. You had, you, you're selling your stuff off and you had an auction in the fall, right? For part of mm -hmm. your collection. Yes. And how did that go? And then you have another auction coming up for the rest of your collection? Yes, I had um, auction in, in uh, the one in November 2023 and uh, the one coming up on the 8th of March is with Eubanks Auction House. And then I did another one with a group called uh, Amplified. And they're an, uh, an entertainment site that uh, focuses just on collectibles, musicians, collectibles, oh. recordings. And they, like Octopusty, they have diversified. And now they include uh, uh, private collections and so on and material. So that's, I've entrusted them and Eubanks with, uh, between the two for my collection. So just by coincidence, the first teaser auction for Amplified, if I can do a plug here. Absolutely. If you want to take a look at it. So it's Amplify with, and then the letter D, dot com. A-M-P-L-I-F-Y-D dot com. Okay. Right. Okay. And then, um. If you look down, it will it will have different auctions that are available and auction rider. Be, so okay. the, th the third of March. Okay. It's ending on the third of March. So. Okay. Well, this Take this episode because... this episode then won't get out until after that. So just, oh, just so okay. You know, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, anyway, amplified. You'll see showcases items. I was really leery about this sending off the stills and contact sheets and even the albums, because a lot of times in auctions, they will uh, bundle everything together. And I knew there were stills in there, especially from the Connery films and the early Connery films that were easily worth a hundred or $200 because I've seen them at other yeah. auctions selling. And that was real fearful each film, you know, maybe would get all bundled together and, ended up selling for $100 or $200 or something. And I knew they'd be worth a lot more. So Amplified focuses, they show each individual still, each individual contact sheet, and then even with the contact sheets, individual frames. Wow. And wow. they do a description, detail, background, estimate value, and so on. So 
and it's done over the course. Oh, this one is close to a month, three weeks to a month. Yeah. People have time to look, research, and so on, and then drop their bid. I've never seen anything like it before. I, I'm there now. It's a very impressive site. It, and you it, can oh, bid yeah, online. I looked at it then, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at, I'm looking at it as we speak. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. right. Okay. It's, it's, he's really, his name is Dan Willis. He's one of the CEOs, and uh, he, he, uh, he I, is the one who came here and looked at my bond collection and so on, so... Yeah. He's the one who said, you know, these need to have a special showcase. And, yeah, uh, this it's a nice site. So, yes, how did the is. auction in November go, and what kinds of things were the hot sellers? Well, the big ones were the uh, quad crowns. Doctor No was, I think, nineteen thousand uh, pounds. Wow. Uh, the one that surprised me was the. Double crown, the 20 by 30 for from Russia with Love, because it's very simple. It's a much smaller, and all it says is James Bond is back. There's 007 logo, not logo. It's just du the digits 007. Oh. And I think it's in real uh, uh, fluorescent orange with the gun lying on top. That sold for 7,000, and uh, oh. I, I never thought it would fetch that much. Wow. So... That was one that, you know, yeah. did a lot better than I thought. Then there were some that I thought should bring in more money, but didn't. So uh, okay. you you learn when you do an auction, but yeah, I that's the thing about auctions. Sometimes it's like, yes. oh, why that one? You yeah. know, some, or some, it, you know, you get it, you get somebody gets into a bidding war. We, you know, sometimes people overpay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is good. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I I remember people get ruthless on eBay. There'd be a real nice still, and I would see it, and I bet a reasonable amount of money. And yeah. then the next thing I know, do I really want to pay eighty five dollars for this? Yeah. So I, you know, I had to look at, you know, you know what my priorities were for the time, and, and yeah. either pass on it and hope it would come up again, or uh, surprisingly, some of these things have, you know, that uh, yeah belong to other people that I knew. So did all the stuff sell in the auction in in November? And if not, does it carry over to another? Uh it will carry over. There were a few items, but you know they were they were the more recent films, No Time to Die, uh okay. Quantum of Solace, things that, you know, either there aren't big collectors or people yeah. think, you know, I can I can get those, but not even a, a pound bid or something kind of hurts. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It should hurt the star who's appearing in the movie more so. <laughs> now, I want to I want to say something about this auction because I've heard you talk in the past about you wanting to get these items to the people who want them. As we age, you know, I I love the fact that you did this, and I imagine it had to be hard as anything to do this. But I've been through the process of trying to clean out my dad's house. Yeah. And it's like, I have no idea what any of this stuff is. And if you're not, if whoever's taking control of cleaning out your house when we're, when we're gone, it's like, are they just going to toss all this? And so I just think it is such a good thing, probably yeah. for you, but also for the, for the James Bond community, that's, because that's you're getting very, this stuff into their hands. That's an excellent point you make. You know, they, they, they really don't appreciate it. They look at something, a poster or whatever, and kind of just dismiss it. But uh, we know, right? We know what yeah, yeah, the value yeah. of these things mean. Yeah. So and, your items are getting into the right hands now, which is great. There's collectors all over the world who are interested in James Bond. It's a phenomenon. Oh, absolutely. And a worldwide yeah. one. But out of the 30,000 items, I, come on, Steve, you had to keep some, right? You can't, yes. you didn't get rid of everything, yeah. did you? <laughs> yeah. Things I regret that are gone now are the radio spots. Oh. I had 27 vinyl radio spots. I don't know any other collector. And this is oh, only no. the, they only did radio spots up to Spy Who Loved Me. Okay. But they did oh. a lot of interview discs people don't know about. They did Connery before Thunderball came out, and then they did Connery after Thunderball came out. They did radio spots, of course, for all the double bills. They did two beautiful radio spots for Dr. No, the first film. Yeah. That was the last one I 
it took me a lifetime, you know, literally, to find all of these, but I got them. There's one. Have you heard of ever heard of Radio Spot? No, no. But you're saying they were on vinyl. Yes, they were in vinyl. Wow. I'm going to. I hope we don't get disconnected. I'm going to play one radio spot for you. I have here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Listen to this one. You'll love this one. This is my favorite out of the thousands of radio spot cuts. This is the best one. Here it is. Fantastic bond sale. Special clearance of all models, all sizes, all shapes in Thunderball and from Russia with love. Guaranteed bond excitement, including two hijacked atom bombs, two beautiful belly dances, an army of aquaparatum, a battalion of fearless partners, a rocket firing motorcycle, plus Rosa Webb. So fantastic. Don Connery in Ian Fleming's Thunderball and from Russia with love. Both in Technicolor, both re released by United Artists, entertainment from Trans America Corporation. Oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. cool. When they mention all the different items in, in each yeah. film, and they say, yeah. plus yeah. Rosa Clem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we heard that part. Though. Perfection. It's yeah. real. That really yeah, is That good. was from like the 60s or something? That was 68, 1968. Okay. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned the interview vinyls. Was that, because I, I know they'll put out things where it's, they'll ask a question, but they send the, the thing out so that a, a interviewer can ask yes. the question and get yes. them play the answer. Is that what you're talking about? Right, right. Those okay. are the those are the interview discs. Although in some of them, I think on Her Majesty's Secret Service, there's a, a short segment with Peter Hunt and he just talks about the movie. Okay. There isn't an announcer, you know, to, and you mm -hmm. get a script with it. And yeah. you okay. ask the question and they say, Hey, that guy's really right. Yeah, the donut. It's, really it's, like, it's like a donut <laughs> spot they used to call it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How'd, those, how'd that guy get to talk to him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. So oh, wow. for the back to the auction for a second. So you have this whole collection and you're going to do multiple auctions with it. How did the appraisal process work? A very good friend, again, Dan with Amplified and some other friends research really, really well. And of course, the people that work at the auction house are, I mean, this is their job. They're experts in a lot of it. There's some areas they might not be real strong in, and they will ask you, you know, what do you think this is worth? And before they post, you know, the uh, the estimate costs, they'll, they'll run it by you. And there were some things that I kind of overpriced, not many, uh, but there were quite a few items that I underestimated the value. Because I... It, I don't know what it, it's in me. I, I feel like I might cheat people if I would charge too much. <laughs> people are saying, you're a fool. You should charge a lot for it because it'll go for a lot of money. If, it, if it's an so, auction, whatever they're willing to pay, that's oh, the yeah. price. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I mean, there are oil shakes, you know, from the Middle East betting on some of these yeah. things. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. All right, man. That was fantastic, Steve. That was a absolutely. lot of fun. We want to thank you, Steve Oxenrider, again, for joining us today, telling your fascinating story. Absolutely. Your James Bond collectibles. Fantastic stuff. If people want to find you, is there a way for them to find you on Facebook or Twitter or X or Instagram or anywhere? Uh, Facebook. I'm on Facebook. All right. That's cool. All right. Thanks again, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the exposure and uh, everyone is raving all the time about the uh, spy movie navigator. So, oh, thank well, thank you, you thank so you. much. And thank you. We are reason. so happy to have gotten you on this show. Cause oh, thank you. Your Exciting background stuff. and your collection and, and other stuff you've done. It's just, it's great for the bond community. And I love the fact that you did the auction. Okay. Thanks again, Steve. Thank all, right. all right. Thank, thank you, Steve. You much. Yep. That's Bye. a wrap. This has been Dan and Tom. Oh, SpyMovieNavigator.com on our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Subscribe to our show through your favorite podcast app and on our YouTube channel as well. Lots of fun stuff there. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you spending time with us.